Everybody I have talked to about teaching tonight has said basically the same thing that Johnny just said, which is Zephaniah is a book in the Bible? No. Um, for a lot of you, tonight will be the first time you've turned to Zephaniah in your Bibles, which I hope that's not the case. I hope you've been following as we go through with Revival Through the Bible. I hope you're reading along. There's a lot to take from Zephaniah. It's a little bit more of a complex book. Uh, but tonight, we're going to do our best with a little bit of a bite-sized chunk. And that's in Zephaniah 3. And we're going to be going 14 through 20. So if you're not there, turn there. All right. It was a good song. So just to give you a little bit of a background, who Zephaniah is, right? Because most of you probably already turned to Zechariah. Make sure you're in Zephaniah. It's like two books to the left, okay? So Zephaniah is what's called, he was a minor prophet. Now, what's interesting about these minor prophets, they're called minor prophets, but they had a pretty major message. Most of them, their message had to do with judgment, both on Israel as well as many of the surrounding nations. Zephaniah lived about 40 to 50 years. This is right around when he wrote this book. He wrote about 40 to 50 years before Babylon took over Israel. So most of you have watched VeggieTales, and you're familiar with Nebuchadnezzar. He's the pickle, right? And he ends up capturing them, and then there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, but he's the pickle. I just want to remind you. So about 40 to 50 years before this, Zephaniah was telling the people of Israel, we have turned away from God. We have turned to idols. We're following other religions. We have false gods in our midst. We're doing things that we're not supposed to be doing. And so he ends up saying judgment upon Israel as well as the surrounding nations for not following God. It's pretty similar if you read Amos, Jeremiah, many of the other minor prophets in that section, a lot of the same messages, which is repent, turn away from your sin, and seek after God. Prophets had been prophesying and begging on behalf of God that the people turn back and repent for hundreds of years. Like I said before, Amos, Jeremiah, there's a whole slew of them. Many of them you probably haven't read, much like Zephaniah, because like I said, they have a little bit of a complex message in them. In these verses, though, in Zephaniah in 3, 14 through 20, we see two different messages being told, both prophetic, one of which describes the first coming of Jesus, and the other, hope for his second coming. So if you're wondering why we're talking about Zephaniah before Christmas, well, I'm going to tie this in a little bit, Okay. So let's go ahead and read Zephaniah 3, 14 through 20 really fast. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your, your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Being that this was written before the Jews, the Israelites, were taking, taken to Babylon, much of this is prophetic about that judgment that would be handled by Babylon. God would allow Babylon to take Israel. He had already allowed Judea to be taken by another nation. The whole area, the whole Middle Eastern area as we know it now today, was just wars and rumors of wars and death and destruction as different nations tried to gain control of the region. Very similar to today, if you're not familiar, a lot of the same things are happening. There's multiple nations, there's kings, there's different people that are trying to gain control. 
And there's unfortunately a lot of death and destruction. God is allowing that to happen today as well. But the prophecies that were made by Zephaniah, as well as many of the other minor prophets, God kept. And that's kind of the main message for tonight. If you take anything from tonight, I want you to know that God keeps his word. Okay, And so what Zephaniah is describing, much of it has already taken place, and much of it is going to take place. And you can bet on it because of what God has already done. God has fulfilled many of his promises. To the Jews at this time, if we look back at how this Savior is described in verse, let's see, when it talks about God being in your midst in verse 17, that sounds kind of like a pipe dream for many of them. Because the whole concept of God, if you remember Moses, when God gave him the Ten Commandments, when he spoke to Moses, he told him to hide behind the cleft of a rock. Because for Moses to see God was to cause death. He would die if he saw God. He had to actually hide himself. So when it talks here about a Savior, about God coming and reigning, it was kind of this weird pipe dream. Things were going on. There were wars. People were dying. Judea was already taken. So how can we believe that there's going to be a Savior? Babylon's on the rise. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. There was a lot of fear and turmoil within the area of Israel. Zephaniah, however, in the midst of those rumors of wars and potential wars for turmoil, reminded them of the ways that they had turned away from God and gave them this promise of a Savior. A Savior that was promised to come to Israel, a Savior that would be born on Christmas Day, and a Savior that was prophesied to heal, revive, and change the world. A promise that he kept, a, promise, a prophecy fulfilled. So tonight's point number one is rejoice and fear not, for the Lord keeps his promises. And as we go through this, you're going to see how there are many different aspects of what we just read in verses 14 through 20 that God has already done. He kept those promises. 500 years before Jesus' birth, the things that Zephaniah said would come true. The book you hold tonight is filled with those promises that God has kept and will continue to keep. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 tells us, We also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For those of you tonight that are holding physical Bibles, when you hold that Bible, do you think to yourself that this is God's word? Do you think that this is God's promises? Do you know how much has been prophesied and has actually come true? I'm sure many of you have heard it, right? You've heard about prophecies about Jesus coming, and then they came true. But many of you, if I were to ask you of any of those prophecies, you probably couldn't name any. That was part of the reason why I thought it would be really cool to go through Zephaniah 3, because this is one area where somebody asks you, what were some of the prophecies about Jesus' coming that you could name? This is one of them. We're going to break that down tonight. Zephaniah invites us all to humbly repent and obey the Lord for deliverance, a message we now that know that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. John 3, 16 through 18 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son, the only Son of God. If you look at verse 15, it says, The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the promise, the prophecy of Jesus Christ coming, of a Savior coming and then taking away those sins from you is true? Because that's what the word in front of you says, and it's either telling you the truth or it's lying. Do you believe that it's true? Well, Zephaniah did 500 years before Christ even came. He told the people of Israel about a Savior that would come, and he would take away their sins, even though they were still in active rebellion against God. And so we today can look at this and know that we have a Savior that's been promised to us, that's been promised to the world, not to condemn us, but to save us. Even though we deserve his wrath, he shows us his love through Christ, just like he said he would. Prophecy fulfilled. In verse 17, 
The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. To the Jew, a lot of this might sound like nonsense at this time. Like I said before, their whole lives were possibly going to be upside down. Other nations were swearing that they would take them over among other nations, and they weren't even one of the strongest nations in the area. They were the strongest nation by far because they had God on their side, but when they didn't have God on their side, they were susceptible to being taken over by these other nations. So thinking about a God being in our midst, a mighty one who will save us, and who will rejoice over us with gladness, most of Israel had turned away from God. This didn't sound familiar. And the judgments that Zephaniah had said probably sound a little bit more apt at that time, right? We deserve judgment. We deserve judgment. That rings a little bit clearer than promises of a God who will walk with us the same way he did in the garden, right? So for Israel, they hadn't really seen God walk with the people since the Garden of Eden. And so to hear this, it was, it was like hearing somebody say high, lofty poetry. Yeah, there's going to be a God that walks with us, and everything's going to be great, and don't worry, everything's going to be fine. Have any of you ever been in a situation where everything looks horribly bleak, and then somebody looks at you and says, oh, don't worry, everything's going to be fine? And you're like, no, but it's not. I don't think it is. That's not necessarily true. You're just saying nice things. That's how this probably would have come across, right? And I know we like to comfort each other that way, and it's usually baseless because we're like, I really don't know what's going to happen next. But if you believe in Christ, if you believe in God, you know there are good things to come. You know that everything is going to be all right. And Zephaniah was telling the people of Israel that he's going to quiet us by his love. He would exult over us with loud singing. He is the mighty one that can save and has saved the, those that follow him. His love by going on the cross was beyond humbling and should leave us speechless. Once again, prophecy fulfilled. What he did completely combated everything. The judgment we, that we were due was taken away from us, right? The salvation that we didn't deserve was given to us. In verse 19, it says, Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame, gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. Prophecy fulfilled. Jesus accomplished all of these things. Perhaps not in the way that Israel thought, right? Because when Jesus came, it wasn't what they thought it was going to look like. But let's look at some of this together. Matthew 21, 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Lepers who were outcast by society had their diseases removed from them. Talk about being an outcast. Those people were put outside of the city. They weren't allowed to talk to anybody, even if it was family, even if you were married. If you became a leper, you left. You weren't allowed in the city. You weren't allowed to go with everybody else. You weren't allowed to go in the pools with everybody else. You were on the complete outside of the city. You do not belong here. And Jesus changed that. Jesus came in and took away those diseases. He took away these people's ailments to show them who he was, to fulfill the promises made by Zephaniah and others. He made the dead walk, the lame rise, the sick healed, the possessed free of their demons. Jesus did so many things that at that time, for the people of Israel during the time of Jesus, it was a time of we were under Babylon, and then we were free for a minute, and then there were the Greeks, and then we were taken over by the Romans. There really wasn't any hope. It just seemed to continue to go on and on and on. God was pouring out his judgment by letting them be subjected to these other nations and feel like they had no hope. But their hope was right there. Their hope was Jesus Christ. Right? God who would walk with us the same way that he walked with Adam in the garden. He walked with the 12 disciples amongst a lot of others to show them who God is, the love of God. And for that reason, point number two, sing praises to him who came to save us through grace and love. Right? That's pretty easy to say when we're going through trials and tribulation. I think it's pretty hard to turn to God and sing praises, right? 
it's a little bit easier to read our Bible. Maybe we'll pray. But how many of us are singing praises to him who came to save us through grace and love? How many of us are settling for this when there's an almighty God that deserves all the glory? He deserves our praise. He deserves for us to sing about him into eternity. When we look at Isaiah 6, and he goes into the temple, and you see the angels, they were singing his praise. His robe filled the temple. He was so amazing, so mighty, that Isaiah fell to his knees. He said, I'm unclean. I'm not worthy to be here. Do you feel that way? When we talk about God, is God that person? Or have you put God here? Do you have a big God or a little God? Do you sing praises to this amazing God who over thousands of years was promised to you, was promised to give you salvation that you didn't deserve to give all of us salvation because he loved you, because he loved all of us. Now, I don't know how many of you have gone through partners or the first chapter they're in, but how many of you have ever heard of the TAN method? Anybody? Maybe one or two? Okay. It was like a really slow, maybe? Don't call on me. Um, so TAN is a hermeneutical tool. I know as soon as I said hermeneutical, a lot of you fell asleep. I saw it just now. Your eyes just rolled back, and you're like, I'm done. So hermeneutical basically means when we look at the scriptures, we're trying to understand what the original authors were trying to say, right? So Zephaniah wrote this in Hebrew thousands of years ago. What was he trying to say? What, what does this mean for us? What did this mean for them, right? Because he was writing to a specific group of people. He was speaking to the king at that time. He was speaking to the people of Israel. He wasn't necessarily speaking to us, but God is speaking to us through this because it is God's word, and we believe that. And so the TAN method means, it stands for then, always, now. Okay, so if you don't know that, I'd suggest you write it down or memorize it really quick. Then, always, now. When we look at scripture, we should always start with then. What was Zephaniah trying to say to the people of Israel at that time? Right? Because he was telling them something that pertained to what they were dealing with at that specific moment in time. Destruction is due because we have not turned from our idols quickly enough. Judgment is due because we have not turned to God and we have sin. Now, what's the message for always? Well, I would argue, like I said before, that always God keeps his promises, right? He's going to keep his word. Now, some of those promises aren't so pretty. Some of them are things like Jesus is coming to save us. Some of them are judgments on entire nations for what they've done. But when we go through this, we should be looking at it through that lens of what was Zephaniah trying to say? What is God saying always? And then what does this mean for us now? Because a lot of you tonight, when you saw Zephaniah, you're like, oh, this is Old Testament. I can push this aside. It doesn't really affect me. It doesn't apply to me because it's Old Testament, right? He was talking to the people of Israel. This doesn't, this doesn't matter for me. Or you might be thinking to yourself, oh, this matters because Jesus came. He was born. And then he died, and he saved me. That's what it was about, right, for me now. Which that is true. Jesus did come so that we could be saved now. But I invite you to look at verse 20. At that time I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. The word fortunes in Hebrew actually means captives. But it has a similar connotation with fortunes. It's kind of an interesting word. But what's really interesting about this passage is that that hasn't happened yet. Right? For the people of Israel, for the people of God, he hasn't presented us before the rest of the people in the entire world and said, look, these are my children. He hasn't made us renowned and praised. He hasn't restored those captives, those fortunes that were due to Israel because of the promises that God made to Israel and to us. This, these things haven't happened yet. So what does that mean for us now? What, how does that change now in light of what we've talked about? Well, 
I would say what's being described here is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Most of you have heard this. If you haven't, Christ is coming back. You should probably read scripture. It talks a lot about it. It's one of the things that we can look forward to, right? The fulfillment of him coming back and taking us home. The millennium, going to heaven, right? What's being described, I believe, is potentially the millennium. What does that mean, though? It means that God isn't done with us, okay? What was written in Zephaniah wasn't just for the people of Israel. And then it wasn't just for the people during the time of Jesus either, when they finally got to take refuge in God who walked amongst them. What it was also about was that promise of things to come. Okay? And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of promises of things that God has told us. When God talks about heaven, he talks about how there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more crying, right? No more death. Those are promises to us. And if you believe that the Bible is the word of God and that God keeps his promises in the same way that he did with Jesus, then we can believe that these promises about heaven, about a savior, for some of us that don't know Christ here tonight, there's a promise that there's a savior, that God loves you so much that he gave up his son, prophesied for hundreds of years before he came. For those of you that do know Christ tonight, he's coming back. There's things to sing about. There's things to be excited about. Our sins have been taken away if you know Christ, if you walk with Christ. It means that God isn't done with us. God hasn't abandoned us since Christ. For a lot of people, when they look at the Old Testament and they look at the New, and they're like, okay, God did a lot of things for about 2,000 years, and it feels like it just stopped. But it hasn't. God is working on each of you. God has things that are still, they haven't come to pass yet. There are amazing promises and prophecies that are laid out for us. And if you believe that God's word is true and that it is God's word, you can be excited about these things that are promised to us. God is working in the world to achieve what he told us would come. Eternity and goodness, joy and love with the Father. Like I said before, a time of no more pain, no more tears. For those of you tonight that have come here and you're struggling with frustration, sadness, anxiety, depression. For those of you that don't feel like there's any hope and you feel choked by the troubles of this world. So did the people of Israel 500 years before Jesus came. They didn't believe that a savior could come. A lot of them turned away from God. They turned to other gods. They started to worship what they wanted to worship. They did what they wanted to do. Instead of waiting for those fulfillments, promises made by God himself to those that would wait to that day that Christ would come. And that still applies to today. There's more to come. Don't let the challenges of this world keep you down. As you face these challenges in your life, and fight the good fight, and run the race that you were given. Remember that we serve a God who saves, and that keeps his promises. Promises of eternity with him, promises of grace, promises of love. If you have a Bible, please turn to Matthew 24. We're going to be looking at Matthew 24, 44 through 51. It's kind of a large chunk, but as soon as I get started, I think you'll understand why we're looking at it. So that's Matthew 24, we're going to be looking at 44 through 51. So verse 44 starts, <clears throat> Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And in verse 45, Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom his, his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing so when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Now, in verse 48, we get another promise. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour when he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Now, if you believe that this is the word of God, and you believe that God keeps his promises, there's two right there for you. Right? And so, what I would ask of each of you tonight, in the knowledge that God does keep his promises, point number three, let not your hands grow weak. Let not your hands grow weak. Don't let the world overtake you. Turn to Christ. Right? In Luke 9, 23, And he, Jesus, said to all, If any would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I'm sure each of us have heard that before. Right? Take up your cross daily. I don't know about you, but for myself, when I hear do something daily, it sounds like a grind. It sounds like something I don't want to do. It sounds like oh, I'm going to have to do this every single day. It's like this never-ending, miserable. For some of you, you might like routines, and you're like, no, that sounds great. I want to do the same thing every single day. For me, like to do something like to exercise, I'm the worst at this. I was in the military for 10 years, and I still hate to exercise every day. I have to push myself. Whereas there's some people in this room, they would get up every day, and they would exercise because they love to do it or – they love that routine, and it's something that comes naturally to them. For me, it's something that goes against my flesh. I'm lazy, right? I think a lot of us are, but I'm being honest right now in front of you. I'm lazy, right? So when I hear of daily, it sounds like such an intimidating word. It gives this idea of a never-ending punishment, a grinding to those who adhere into the dust, which is probably how some of the Jews that were spread across the face of the earth felt as they waited for the coming of the Messiah. Can you imagine being taken from your home and transplanted across the world, or that's how it felt at that time, to a different nation where they worship different gods? And maybe you were tortured, you were treated as a slave, you were killed for your faith. Can you imagine waiting for the Messiah to come, how horrific that would feel? But then that same thing has kind of always been the case, right? Then, always now, the tan method. Look at now. There's still Christians that are persecuted for their faith. There are still Christians that are waiting for the second coming of Christ. They're desperate for God to come home. And even though each day is a struggle and they have to face that grind, or at least that's what I'm calling it right now, we'll see in a second, it's not so much of a grind. They find that comfort in Christ. They find comfort in who God is. And they're able to overcome those things. You go to Jer Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8, says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. I've always thought this was interesting. If you look at this verse real quick, like I said, it's Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8, if you want to turn there. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. Right? He starts out with this kind of generic statement. Blessed are the people who trust in God. Right? That's really easy to say. But then he says, blessed is he who tr whose trust is the Lord. There is no hope. There is nothing to be hopeful for outside of who Christ is. There is nothing to be excited for outside of who God is and what he has done for you. The promises that he has kept since the beginning of time, painting his character and how true to his word is, he is, is what should be giving us hope in the darkest of times. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its, root, sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. What it's saying right there is for the person that has placed their trust in God, for the person who loves God and chooses to follow him, who takes up his cross daily and follows the Savior that was given to all mankind, if we would only turn to him, if you do that, it's not a grind. In fact, it's invigorating. In fact, if you were to imagine yourself as a tree, that produces fruit because you're planted next to a stream. God gives us the strength to do what we need. Whereas the people in the world, what hope do they have? 
where does their strength come from, right? The trees that are planted out in the middle of the desert, and they don't have that living water to go to. For the people that don't know God and they're living in this world, they don't know the promises of what has happened and what is to come, where is their hope? For those of you that go to public school, for the homeschoolers, if you go to co-op or if you have friends in your neighborhood or even if your friends are at church and these are the people that you have in your life, if you know people that don't know God, they can't be happy. There's nothing there. There's no promises. There's nothing. There's life and then there's death. There's an old saying, I'm trying to remember as I speak, there's only two things promised in this world and it's death and taxes, right? You'll hear that a lot from different adults. But for a Christian, that's not true at all, right? The only thing that's promised to us is exactly what God has told us. God's word, the word that's in your hands right now. And he's told us so many things, things that give us hope, things that should inspire us to keep going, things that help us not grow weak as we face the challenges of this world. And that doesn't mean, for those of you that are listening to me and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, but you don't know my problems. You don't know the stress that I'm facing. You don't know the depression that I face. You don't know the issues I have with my parents, my friends at school. Yeah, but God does. When you consider who Jesus was, the fact that he died on the cross for you, I, I would argue you don't know the pain that he went through for you. He loved you. That God who came down and died for you does know your pain. I don't know your pain. God knows my pain. But God's who I have to turn to every day in order to combat those moments of depression, anxiety, frustration, anger, whatever they are. Because God is my only promise. Outside of that, it's just death and taxes. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our, our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Does that sound exhausting to you? Do you believe that this is God's word? Right? So if you believe that this is God's word, he's telling you, I will give you comfort. When he talks about the Holy Spirit to the disciples, he says he's sending a comforter, a helper. Right? He doesn't say, I'm going to give you more burdens and sorry, life's just this thing that rolls by and it's it's painful and you just got to get through it he says no i'm going to give you comfort i'm going to give you joy in trials i'm going to give you hope hope that the rest of the world couldn't possibly understand as you move forward with your week i want you to remember that christ carried his cross for you that christ was prophesied to come christ was prophesied to die for you Christ was prophesied to be your Savior, and God kept his word, and thank God he did. I don't know about the rest of you, but I am not perfect when it comes to keeping my word. There have been so many times in my life that I'll tell somebody I'm going to do something, and then guess what? It doesn't happen. Or there's even been times that I've told God I would do something. I think maybe a lot of us have done that, where we'll say, God, if you do this, God, if you help me with this test, God, if you help me figure this out, I will do X, Y, and Z. And then all of a sudden something works out or maybe it doesn't. We completely forget what we said to God. But what's amazing about Zephaniah 3, 14 through 20, or 20 is that God kept his promises, right? I'm barely touching the surface here. Do you know how many prophecies there are about Christ? So many. And there's even more that we'll probably find out when we get to heaven. We're like, oh, that makes sense now. I didn't even realize that that was pointing to Christ or that that was pointing to this. God keeps his word. God has told you everything you need to know in that book that's in your hands. Are you turning to it? Are you trying to find comfort in it? Are you seeking after God? Are you treating that book like it is the word of an almighty God that has promised the Savior to you and then fulfilled that promise? I don't even think most of us have friends that are that nice. We have friends that will tell us they'll do things, and they don't keep their word either. 
We have family members that will tell us to do something, and they fall short. And we all fall short, right? But God doesn't. What you're holding is his word. What you're holding are his promises to you, to each of us, because he loved you. As we get closer to Christmas, I want you to remember why we celebrate the coming of Christ. If you enter into the mind of a person in Israel 500 years before he was born, it looked like death, doom, and destruction. Judea was taken by the Assyrians. Israel was soon to fall. Nothing looked like it could be saved. People were turning away from God in droves. There's one king during that time who tried, but it wasn't enough because the people of Israel wouldn't turn to God. And so God's judgment came onto Israel. And for those that were there, it, it felt almost hopeless. Outside of the words of what we're told in the Bible, it felt hopeless. For a lot of us living our lives, as you get older, life gets harder. Life does not get easier. You're going to be faced with newer and more complex problems, issues, frustrations as you get older, things that you don't know how to navigate. And if you don't have God's word in your life, it's going to feel hopeless. You're going to feel like the only two things in the world are death and taxes, right? And so for tonight, for those that do not know God, I want you to know that he keeps his word. I want you to see that. What's interesting is that these words are still read by the Jews, by the people who claim to be the people of God. They still read these words. Even though it prophesied Christ's coming, they still read it, and they still don't realize who Christ is and what he did for them. And that's incredible. Because he did so much for us, and it was told before it would even happen. And you can bank on that, that they said something 500 years before his birth, and even the people that don't believe in it still keep it as the word of God, even though it directly tells us of Christ's coming, his death, and our salvation through him, right? That's incredible. That's what you're holding in your hands right now, those fulfilled prom prophecies, those promises. From the beginning of time to the end of time, that book is all you need because it's God telling you what you need to survive, to thrive, to grow like a tree next to living water. Without it, there is no hope. There's nothing. Without God, there is no hope. There's nothing. For those that do know God today, I want you to remember, don't let your hands grow weak. It's going to get tempting. As Christians, as people, you're going to grow tired. You're going to have days where you don't want to do what you're supposed to do. It's going to feel like a daily grind. But then as soon as you get back into God's word, as soon as you start talking to me, you're going to find that comfort in that God who loves you, that God who gave you a savior, who told us thousands of years before Christ came that he was going to come, and that he was going to save you, that he was going to give you joy, that he loves you. Don't grow weary. Don't let your hands grow weak. And during that time, do the Lord's work in the joy and remembrance of Christ's prophesied birth. Remember that God keeps his promises. And remember that there's promises of things yet to come. As we move forward, if there's days where you're like, I don't really want to help out of church. I don't really want to do anything. Remember what Christ did for you. Remember that he keeps his word and that there's two types of servants at the end of the day. There's the servant that decided to keep serving his master. Until he came back, then there's the servant who grew tired and didn't seek after God and didn't plant himself next to that living water, who didn't find joy in the promises that were fulfilled in the word that you're holding in your hands today. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for bringing us here tonight. I pray that, I pray that something grows in us, Lord, where... We begin to recognize how amazing and how powerful you are, Lord, how you've given us more than we deserve and you continue to do so and that you're not done with us yet. Just because things happened yesterday and years before that, Lord, you have so much more for us as, as things go on. Lord, and I pray that you, you give us a desire to, to grow alongside you, to walk with you, to be like Christ, to carry our cross daily, 
Lord, so that we could find that comfort that defies understanding, Lord. I pray that you help us grow and that we seek after you and that you be that rock, that firm foundation on which we can stand and the rest of the world looks at and can't even comprehend. Lord, we love you so much. I pray that you're here with us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.